if you want to put the spotlight on me as well, that would be might be helpful as well. But absolutely. All right. Hi, I'm Dave Harridan, PDG. Uh, three or four years ago, I can't even remember the years, but anyway, uh, this is my favorite topic that I love: is community needs assessments. It's one that uh, I've personally been involved with on for several years, and uh, we've developed pretty good. And it's just a huge uh, opportunity to make a difference in your community. So I've got about 45 slides here, but uh, actually about 85. But we'll try to trim it down a little bit. But here we go. So. Um, Bear with me one second. There we go. Community needs assessment. Hey, there's a lot of people out there in our communities these days that we want to help impact, make their lives a little bit better. So let's talk about how we can do that. So what is a CNA? We have a new acronym. You know, Rotary's got all of its acronyms. Well, here's a new one. It's called CNA. Belcheck always wants to take it to C-A-N, meaning can, but it's actually a C-N-A. So what is a community needs assessment? Well, first of all, it's understanding what are the community's strengths and challenges. Also, it's about, talks about opportunities for service projects. So when you start asking people about it to make an assessment of the needs in your community, it's amazing the kind of things that you can find out. It is the absolute, in my view, the best way to strengthen a Rotary Club. You have in your domain a club that is floundering or just can't seem to get going. This will get them in gear, and we'll talk more about that. A CNA, a Community Needs Assessment, also helps prevent duplication or redundant community efforts. You know, there's a lot of organizations out there. There's Lions, Optimus, and other community organizations out there, and all of them are looking to make a difference in their communities. But a community needs assessment, if properly run, helps reduce the duplication or, as I say, redundant community efforts to try and assess what's going on in the community. It also is a way to gather different views on what's possible. You know, you can go on your street corner. I mean, in every one of your towns, in my town as well, if you just go stand on the street corner, it's amazing the things you can find out there to just target Rotary Clubs to make a difference in their communities. And as I said kind of earlier, it kickstarts a club to create something new and exciting that really gets them in the gear of fulfilling our motto, service above self. So there's a lot of different community assessment tools out there. Uh, there's surveys, obviously, they can be written, they can be conversations, they can be online. So you can certainly put together a survey out there and just ask people what's going on in their community and what do they need. There's also what's called an asset inventory. Uh, that involves, frankly, just walking or sitting around and observing what's valuable. Like I said earlier, you can just sit on the corner of your, one of your uh, coffee shops or something like that and just watch what's going on. And if you look really close, you know, maybe the sidewalk needs power washing. Maybe you need to pick up trash. There's always something out there to be done. There's also a process called community mapping, where you literally draw a map and you ask people in the community or people in the shops that are in your community how often to places are visited around the community. If you've got tourist areas or something like that, the process of community mapping often comes into play to just find out what's going on and what the needs are. There's also a daily activity schedule. Work and visitation, you can determine the work and visitation habits of residents and local employees. And you've probably heard of community cafes where you ask people what their general perception of their community is. You can do that on an invitation basis, or you can just stand on a corner and take a survey and click that off, a community cafe. But the one that I really like and that we found would be highly successful is basically a focus group, which is nothing more than a planned conversation around assessing the true needs of your community from a lot of different people's perspectives. So we talk about a community leadership focus group. The purpose of that focus group is to bring community leaders and active stakeholders. And everybody, of course, has got a stake in their community. Inviting them to share their views about the community. It's a conversation. It's not a presentation. It's a conversation. It's a conversation that requires very careful planning to be effective. And it requires purposeful and precise listening skills. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But that's really the purpose of a community leadership focus group. It's also an opportunity. CNA, Community Needs Assessment, positions Rotary in the community as the community leader. 
which is a which are really is a great thing to do. It brings leaders of the community and egos <laughs> together. So councilmen, nonprofit executives, et cetera, you know, everybody's got egos out there, especially in governmental. And so at bringing those people together, and actually if you invite people to come to a group meeting uh, that are from neighboring townships or neighboring communities, it's amazing how you'd be surprised how they don't communicate with each other. When you bring them together, it kind of settles down their egos and gets them working together. It does allow the exchange of various views. Everybody's got a different view about what's going on. You got a, a 40 people in a meeting, I guarantee you, there'll be probably 80 different views about what's going on. It begins what I call community alignment among fellow community leaders. In other words, it gets everybody started on the same path together so that we're all going in the same direction. All the leaders in the community are going in the same direction. And frankly, it provides access when you conduct a community needs assessment done well, it provides access to many, many, many potential service projects, which as we all know, really help get a community in action. You know, I look at, uh, everybody's got ideas about what's going on and everybody's got results out there. But being people of action, the thing that really bridges that together is actions. You know, I've got a lot of friends of mine that always have great ideas, but they never create any results because they just don't know how to get in action about accomplishing something. The great thing is, and if you want to create new results in your community, guess what? That takes new actions. And if you want to create new actions for your community, that takes new ideas. That's called impact. When you have certain ideas that you get put into action to create results. That's what is called impact. It will really make an impact in your community. And that includes kids, that includes uh, teenagers, that includes seniors include groups all over the place. We have the power in Rotary to impact everybody's life in our community in some way. So let's talk about what that Rotary Club opportunity is. First of all, by conducting a community needs assessment, it helps gain awareness of the club and the community. I'll show you some specific examples of that at the end of the program. It makes people understand what Rotary is and what we're purposing and what we're doing in the community. It certainly provides membership growth opportunity. When people hear about what Rotary is doing in that community, they want to get together and participate in that. You might not necessarily want to go to a meeting, but certainly get involved uh, for any kind of service project that we've got out. It fulfills our service above self mission. No way, best way that I've ever seen possible. And it positions the club as the public community leader and you're positioning yourself to be out there soliciting input from the, from the uh, community itself. So I want to talk a little bit about the CNA meeting preparation, including ITs, meeting size, advanced planning, education preparation, conversations that you have online, and uh, what the meeting follow-up looks like. So it's getting into the weeds a little bit. People say, well, how do you really create one of these things? So I'm going to take you through the steps of what that looks like. So what are potential participants in a community needs assessment group meeting? Local townships, mayors, town managers, town council members, neighboring townships, as I mentioned earlier, their mayors, their town managers, their town council members as well. County, uh, some, some have boroughs, but commissioners, town managers, town council members, community services, police chiefs, fire ambulance chiefs, hospital executive. <laughs> I've got to go off on a sidebar because it's my favorite story. So I sat one day with the, my local police chief and I went in there just one-on-one -on -one to introduce myself and just have a conversation with him about what's going on in his world. Which by the way, that's a great question. If you really want to find out what's going on in somebody else's world, just ask him that. What's going on in your world? Then you just sit back and listen. It's amazing what you'll find out. So I sat down with the chief and said, you know, what's going on in your world? And he told me about things that are going on. I told him about Rotary a little bit. I said, if there's one thing we could do to help uh, meet what's going on in your world, what would that be? And he sat back in his chair a little bit. And he just kind of looked up in the air. And that's when you know he answered or asked a really great question when they kind of reflect upon it. And he says, corners. What do you mean corners? He's got a lot going on in his world, 
crime and everything else. He said, corners. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, I got one project that I can't get anybody to do. We always have a real problem with people parking too close to the corners at intersections. And that causes traffic problems, et cetera. I need somebody to go out there and paint yellow around all the corners in our community. Um, the community I live in is about a square mile, one square mile, so it's not that big. And uh, I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'll give you the paint. I just needed somebody to go out there and paint all the corners for me because I can't get the public works people to do it. <laughs> of all the things in the world, I would not have guessed, here's the, something that's really bugging him. He picks that one. So guess what? Two weeks, man, we were out there painting quarters. And he was a happy camper. And I will never get a speed team ticket in my community. I can see that. <laughs> so you never know what's going to pop up on somebody's radar. You can talk to civic leaders, chamber of commerce, downtown development organizations, other service clubs. I love when the Lions come to our community assessment meetings so that they can be involved because we're sitting there leading this effort and they're sitting over there and just watching and listening. <laughs> That's a great experience. Nonprofit organizations, obviously, all of our nonprofit organizations are, don't have enough money, they don't have enough resources, they don't have enough people. They're crying for help out there. They're, that's probably one of the best sources of uh, needs that, that you'll encounter out there. And other community organizations like churches, veterans of foreign wars, all of that. If you put together a list of all those kinds of people out there, it's amazing the people that you can become involved. And of course, obviously, you want to get your Rotary Club members involved as well. Club presidents, club president elects, club vice president, board members, and then other members as well. So there's a lot of people out there you can begin asking the question, either individually or group-wise, as to what's some of the needs in the community from your standpoint. Group size matters when you're trying to bring people together. <clears throat> you can certainly do a good job of asking some of the needs of the community just on a one-on-one -on -one interview, like I example I gave of sitting down with a police chief. But that takes a lot of time and it does take a lot of energy. And really you're only getting one view from one perspective. Uh, you can also do this in small groups. So if you don't have a lot of resources, uh, you can do this in small groups and just bring a group of people together, say three to 10 people, and just have a round table discussion as to what's working for them and what's not. But the one that I really like, quite frankly, is large groups. 20 to 30 people is probably best. I wouldn't get many more than that because uh, this is too big of a group to handle in a conversation together. But that's a good group. And you get a lot of different views about what's going on in the community, good and bad. And uh, that's the one I'm, that I've seen be most successful. So let's talk about planning the meeting. And we've gotten into the weeds a little bit, but it's important because you really wanna have great credibility when you're putting this meeting on. So select a date and time and give your potential uh, invitees, lots of advance notice. For the most part, they're busy people. So you know, start a couple, even three months out there and early, we uh, begin inviting people to a meeting. But just set the time and date way out. Start with phone calls, not email or snail mail, snail mail, because they don't probably know who you are. If you send them an email in the blue, that's gonna go in the trash bin for sure. So start with making some phone calls and conduct what I call an enrollment conversation. This is really crucial. It's important that you practice what that conversation is going to look like because we all get spam calls from everybody and you know you don't listen to them very long or don't even pick up. So it's important that you structure a conversation, practice it with your fellow Rotarians before you really begin recruiting people to attend this meeting. So here's what that looks like. Practice it. Tell them who you are. Check to assure that they can talk at that moment. It's always important because if they're busy, they're not going to listen to you anyway. Tell them why you are called. You're calling because you're interested in uh, finding out about the needs of the community. Invite them to a free breakfast conversation or dinner or lunch. But I like breakfast because that starts people on the early in their day. Dinner, sometimes they're after work meetings, they're sometimes tired and may not give you the input and time that you're really looking for. And the topic is really about helping our community to become a better place to live, work, play, and shop. Consider, would you consider the possibility of attending and see if they'll show up? The meeting setup is important as well. Uh, I like semicircular seating, but pick a nice facility that's large, that's private and professional, quiet room for eating and talking. 
you don't want to be in a meeting room in a hotel or near a bar or anything where there's a lot of noise going on. You want this to be a professional event that brings people in so that everybody can hear each other well. Don't make it crowded. And put them in a semicircle or a half round table seat. Soft, rounded is comfortable. That way everybody can see everybody and have face-to-face -face contact, not necessarily a square you. Everybody needs to easily see each other for these kinds of interactive conversations that we're going to be having. In terms of the meeting setup, uh, sp put special direction signs and entrance facilities branded with a rotary logo. Make sure that that thing says it's a community needs assessment. Make it professional. We'll just put something on a, scratch it out on a piece of paper or something on the top of the door. Really make it look professional. Use 3M sticky blank chart pads. Hang, we're going to be hanging those on the walls. And uh, put two or three sturdy chart pads and ease these up because you're going to be capturing a lot of information during a lot of conversations. And use multiple color and thick markers. These are really pretty basic stuff, but you'd be surprised how many times that the, these things don't exist and it just doesn't make it look very professional. You want to use one facilitator, maybe one to two scribes. No PowerPoints. This is not a presentation. Facilitator and scribes are there to be listening, not talking. Make sure whoever you've got up there has got good handwriting. It sounds simple, but you'd be surprised how much people's handwriting is really lousy on chart pads. Everybody's got to read this stuff. No podium. And the facilitator needs to be a professional or a really good amateur. Knows how to listen precisely and patiently. Knows how to engage others when there's silence. And is a positive and enthusiastic demeanor about them. And the scribes, it's important that they use the exact words that are articulated. Don't write something different than what people said. So look for their verbs and look for their nouns and write exactly what they're writing. Don't try to interpret for them what they're saying. Day of the meeting, set the well room well in advance, have a welcoming host at the door, standing, not sitting at a table. Pre-event cocktails are always nice, uh, maybe not for breakfast, but we could have mimosas, I guess. <laughs> but it's amazing, a little wine or beer or something just loosens the tongue and frees the mind for some really creative thinking. And uh, have Rotary members there engaging the guests in pre-meeting conversation. But if you've got four Rotarians standing over there waiting for the meeting to begin and they're talking to themselves, that's not their job. They're there to welcome their guests and bring them in and involve them in what's going on. Uh, in terms of food, simple sandwiches or light buffet is good. Like, make it elegant and polite. Don't have a lot of food because everybody will get sleepy on you. Make sure you've got a printed agenda and names and titles of all the attendees so everybody can get to know each other. And uh, begin the meeting. Get your food, sit down, and let's begin because this is a working meeting. We're here to get some work done. So in summary, just looking at the uh, logistics there, get your guest list together, make a nice location that's classy, food and snacks, keep it light, lots of advance notice, make personal phone calls to these people, follow up emails and all snail mails as well. I have a skill facilitator and a scribe, and serve them light up there. <laughs> so what's the conversation look like when you bring, let's say, 30 people together? What are the questions that you want to ask in order to make sure this meeting flows well? Well. First question is, hey, describe our community. Shut up and listen. May have to call on some names because nobody likes to go first, but just get a general narrative open question like this and just ask them to describe their community. And after a few people have shared their community, then we get into the fun part. How is our community doing, <clears throat> excuse me, on a scale of one to 10? How's your Rotary Club doing on a scale of one to 10? Some say three, some say nine. We'll average about a seven in general, having done that question many, many times. So, uh, but how is your community doing on a scale of one to two? And go around and have everybody put that on the chart pad. The next question is what's working well in our community? That's a great question because it starts everybody off on a positive note. Hey, there's a lot of great things going on in our community. It's amazing what we've accomplished. So start them out on a positive note and have them be bragging on their community. Then there's the next question. Well, what's not working so well in our community? And that's where they'll start reflecting and people might start griping because people just like to gripe. So, uh, but ask the question and find out what the challenges are in the community. Things are not working really well. And then this next question is my favorite. What's missing in our community? 
So envision you're standing up there and you got some, you got two uh, uh, script hands up there. And you got a whole list of things that are working, and then you got a whole list of things that are not working. This what's missing in our community is a great question because what we're trying to do here is take those things that are not working and move them over into the working category. It's not saying there's anything wrong with our community. There's nothing wrong with our community per se. It's just that there's some things missing that if we put those things in place, we'd be able to take them out of that not working category and move them over to the working category. It's a great question. Oops, sorry. And then after you've gone through that process, what's the perfect 10 community look like? In other words, our community we said was about a seven. Same thing for our Rotary Club. They'll all answer about seven. What's a perfect 10 community look like? And that's when you transform them from the world of where they're at today to a future world. To what do we, what do we really want to create? To make our club or our community, our family, <laughs> or anybody a perfect 10. What is involved in that? What's really important to you and to our community, our citizens and our neighbors? And what's really important to us? What do we want to achieve as a community together, family, friends, work, et cetera? And what opportunities exist for Rotary to create something new and extraordinary in our community? And that's where you start getting ideas for projects. Talking about money, labor, talent, service, manpower, organization, more importantly, what you're demonstrating and standing in front of 30 or 40 people is leadership. So here's some meeting techniques to think about. Capture everything on chart paper. Hang them on the wall for all to see. You get those chart papers up there looking really well, and I'll show you some examples in just a minute. But that provides a group memory so that everybody can see what's up there and really help stimulate their thinking about what they want to maybe possibly create. Do not look for or try to describe solutions. That comes later. Right now, we just wanted to talk about where we're at, what's missing, where we might want to go. Gather ideas and look for future possibilities. As I always say, you know, when you live in the world of possibility, you can create anything that you want. And avoid those past-based dialogues. Any group will drag you down really quickly by talking about past challenges, things that are not working, et cetera. Begin to create future-based conversations as to what's possible out there and what do we want to create. And then at the end of the meeting, of course, you know, you say it's a great meeting, restate and summarize what you've heard. Pass forward is we're going to absorb this and come back to you with some ideas and possibilities that we can all work on, create together. And thank you for joining us tonight. And you're out of it. Hour and a half, two hours, maybe max. The key is to listen, listen. Listen, you really got to listen up. It's not about you. If you're talking, you're not listening. It's neurologically impossible to talk and listen at the same time effectively. It's about service above self. It's about what they're talking about and what their concerns are for the community and using their ideas to create, frankly, service projects. After the meeting, thank you, phone call, follow up. Send some handwritten thank you notes, include a small rotary gift if you want. Mm. Establish a future date for getting back together. That is important because you want to report back to these people all the inputs that you've heard and what you're proposing to accomplish as a result of what you've heard. And of course, I do a rotary meeting. Every one of the people sitting in that room is a potential member and they'll really like what they're seeing you doing up there. And stay in touch with these people because they are your key to your future in terms of in our motto of service above self. Here's a case study. Uh, it's a, a CNA that we did a few years ago, but I want to take you through it and just see the impact that a two-hour meeting can have. So we conducted a CNA meeting. It had 36 community leaders associated with it. You can see my good friend Ted standing up there, who's a really great facilitator. No podium, you know, no PowerPoint presentation. He's just having conversations with all these people in this room. And we were not able, unfortunately, to put them in a circular motion, but frankly, it worked out pretty good in the seating that you see there. And we asked those 36 community leaders, how's our community doing? One to 10, what's working, what's not working, what's missing? It's a perfect 10 look like, what actions are needed, et cetera. Here's the charts we generated. Full of their, what they're saying. And you can see at the top of those, the ones on the left, you know, a couple charts of what's working, what's not working, what's missing. 
There's four charts there of what's missing. That's called opportunity. And what's a perfect 10 look like? And what actions can we all take together to uh, improve our community? It really works well. Notice the good, I think that's my handwriting actually, which is not great, but at least they can read it, <laughs> hopefully. So the analysis of all that data that we got back produced 25 potential project ideas that we, to a large degree, had not thought of. We distilled those down into really five different categories of education, housing, and transportation needs in our community. And then we kind of had a catch-all, which we called to community development, and there was some job training in there as well. But as a board, we said, uh, board for the club, we said, let's great, let's focus on these three things here, education, housing, and transportation in that order of priority. Well, here's what came out of an education, the need for pre-K education, parenting classes, because we live in a migrant community of uh, mushroom workers that are here, Hispanic people that really get along well in our community and the culture is best very well, and still there's a need out there, as well as adult literacy. So here are the, the impact that we were made as a result of getting in action around that. We supported what we call the maternal health and child consortiums parenting classes. These were parents of migrant workers who just uh, really were having challenges with language, transportation, all of that. We donated $8,800, plus there was all kinds of volunteer opportunities for us to babysit the kids while they were putting on those programs. We also supported pre-K need-based scholarships. We donated $27,000 to these three organizations in order to provide better pre-K education, which is such an important key to kids' development early in life. So that was our education portfolio as we started. Housing. Now, we need additional workforce housing. People can't afford to live in our area, as well as we need a sustainable housing repairs for people. So we partnered with Habitat for Humanity we donated a total of $50,000, not just from our clubs, but several other clubs, as well as providing volunteer labor to construct 40 homes. There's a story behind that, but that $50,000 allowed them to borrow the money that they needed because they were building five homes at a time. It allowed them to borrow the money, pay for the interest to build those 40 homes out there. So uh, they basically had to borrow about a million dollars. And then of course, he said we would support building those homes, those five homes for one year on a construction loan. That cost about $50,000. We partnered with an organization called Good Neighbors that goes around the community and uh, fixes home repairs for people. We donated $8,000, plus we had all these volunteer opportunities for us to go out there and bang nails and do all kinds of stuff in these homes. Then transportation. The needs is to reduce transportation costs and increase transportation availability. So our impact was a lot on this. Auto repair, we developed what's called a trusted partner network, which brought together a lot of different shops to work on uh, cars for people, cars and trucks, uh, so they didn't feel like they were getting taken. We put together a car buyer assistance program because a lot of people in our community just don't understand the process of buying a car. Sometimes they get you know, pay these exorbitant prices for cars in front of us, and this meeting would be pending. We found great value cars and inspected and validated them. People come in and shop sometimes with cars that won't pass the state inspection. So we took those cars and sometimes we, we said they're not repairable. So we helped them go about finding another one. <coughs> we helped them seek low financing rates for car purchases. Quite frankly, one of my rotary friends is a car dealer and uh, he charges exorbitant interest rates for people who buy cars from him. Short-term low-cost rental programs, provided educational offerings for people about car maintenance, insurance, you know, what's good insurance, what's not, purchasing cars, and developing volunteer driver program, for primarily for seniors to get around and just for whatever reason don't have a connection with uh, public transportation. So the next steps to success was to, frankly, after we got all that done, was to assess the ongoing success of current initiatives. Whether it's important to stay on top of all these things that you create, make sure that you've got a continuing path for that. Expand solutions in the three priority areas. In fact, we're getting ready. To, this was about two years ago, and we're getting through, ready for uh, this spring to create another community needs assessment and just keep that conversation going with existing as well as new people, um, which is basically revisiting the community needs assessment process, meet again with the leaders. Uh, and then we're expanding our own volunteer labor commitments to support new and longer term projects, Habitat, Good Works, another repair facility, preschool education, and other new ventures. 
So it provides that path to just keep going with your club in terms of providing service above self efforts. Because it's all about service above self. That's the game we're in, you know. Uh, this is a great process that we found that works well. You also get some pretty good PR on that. Here's a huge article that we didn't even do anything. We just had this meeting, a two hour meeting, and we got all this press for it. So when do you conduct a CNA? Ooh, now, now's the time to do this. To really begin building excitement for the coming rotary year. Plan and prepare now. Execute it in the spring before mid-June if you can, because that will set you up for a really great year coming up. Set up the next, as I said, set up the next, it sets up the next rotary year. So here's my favorite quote that I like. If you want to find yourself, get lost in the service to others and the heart of God. Questions, thoughts? That was it in a nutshell. Hope it might generate some interest and some uh, solutions for you to share with your clubs. If anybody has any questions for Dave, you can unmute yourself and ask, or you could type in the chat box, whichever you prefer. We'll do that for a few minutes, and then we're going to break out into small groups, which will be facilitated by your, a, um, your assistant rotary coordinator. I see you, Peter. Um, well, Alex, let's do that. Okay, Peter, unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, Dave, great presentation. Uh, great to get the slides. We could. Um, how much was there any uh, issues with your your club buying into this, and did it take a while? It seems like a visioning to a certain degree. Um, did it take a lot of you know two or three champions to really shepherd this through? Sure, like anything it does. You know, it, it takes a champion. <laughs> you know, a couple of champions to be able to take it on and say, "Hey, this is where we're going." What do you think? So, but yeah, it, it, any initiative like this requires some champions. There's a lot of obstacles associated with this. I might make it sound a little easy. It is a lot of work. First of all, you just, and when I give this presentation to individual clubs, I say step number one is just go make a list of people that you would invite. And that's a challenge. That takes some time. Who's the mayor? Who knows the mayor? And some of these people you may not know. So yeah, like anything new, uh, it's gonna take a couple of champions, meaning club presidents, and the club president elects to get in the game. This is called the game of Rotary. Um, Dave, Evan asked if, um, are you willing to share your slides for the presentation so I can send them out to everybody? Oh yeah, plagiarize the hell out of them. 